Coming up on KCCI 8 News Close Up, many new faces at the Iowa Legislature hear from first time lawmakers from both sides of the aisle on major bills passed this session. And renewable fuels versus electric vehicles. Why former Iowa Governor Terry Branstad argues to Congress that electric vehicles are not the best solution to fight climate change. And expanding health care. The law Governor Reynolds signed last week, she says, will get more health care workers to rural Iowa. This is Iowa's news leader. This is KCCI 8 News Close Up. Good morning and welcome to Close Up. I'm Chief Political Reporter Amanda Rooker. Republican House Speaker Pat Grassley credits a flood of new faces at the State House for helping pass several major bills that have stalled in the legislature in years past. I sat down one on one with one of those first year lawmakers. Republican Representative Bill Gustoff from Des Moines shares his take on this year's legislative session. Well, you just wrapped up your first legislative session. Congratulations on making it through. Thanks. Well, we know it's it's very busy. There's a lot to learn um, and get accustomed to quickly. What was your experience like as a first time lawmaker? Well, I went in with a little experience because I've been an advocate, a part time lobbyist for several years. So I think I knew a little bit what to expect, but it was this was a very robust session. A lot happened very quickly. We passed a lot of big things. So. It's one of the most active sessions I can remember in the 16 years or so that I've been involved up there. And uh, so I learned, I learned that I didn't, what I didn't know, <laughs> which was I thought I knew a lot more than I did and it was just hard to keep up with it all. So that, that was good. It was very hard to keep up. I'm a citizen legislator. I live locally, so I still go home. I'm husband and father and I still have a law firm that I'm part of, so I'm still active here. And so keeping up was difficult. Um, tackling big issues as they came up, there's just so much to read there that it's hard to keep up with it. But it was good. It was, I, was, I appreciated the crew we had and the people in both parties, frankly, to pick their brains on their perspectives and their backgrounds, it was very, that was very beneficial. Is there any one thing that you were the most surprised by or a moment that, you, uh, that you'll remember from this past session? Uh, so, you know, you always get, every year you get a little bit of that House and Senate dispute, and, <laughs> and, and I have friends in both chambers, so I kind of tried to stay out of that fray, but, so that surprised me a little more than I thought it would. I, I expected it, but uh, it, it, it's just part of the drama that happens up there every year, and uh, it's, probably part, a necessary part of the process to slow some things down sometimes. So that was a little surprising. Um, I thought maybe I'd be able to have some more, frankly, bipartisan discussions and things, but it's, it's hard because people get in their lanes and sometimes it's hard to get everybody to stop talking their talking points. So that was a little more frustrating than I thought, than I expected it to be. Sure, and part of it too, you're on the campaign trail and talking about the impact that you're gonna bring up to the State House, and there's a lot of lawmakers that have things they wanna get done. Do you feel like you were able to have an impact or contribute some things that you had been hoping to bring from your perspective? Yeah, I do. I think uh, as a freshman legislator, I think I had a pretty good year. I introduced several bills because I've been working on ideas for several years. Uh, some of those made it into law. For example, remote will signing was, was one that was handed to me. I was going to join the 21st century and some of our surrounding states that allow that. I get the geeky attorney stuff, so they don't make headlines. But one that, one that I got entrusted with as a freshman was the commercial vehicle tort reform. And so the governor signed that earlier this week. And I, I was proud to be the floor manager of that one. So that, that was a big bill. Uh, I was entrusted to run the uh, uh, updates to the guardianship and conservatorship law that has been, an, oh, it's been a battle going on five or eight years there. And so very disparate parties. We were very close to it. It just died in second funnel, but I'm um, very optimistic we'll get that done next year. So some of those big things, the education issues, I'm on education and judiciary. Those two committees had, I think, at least in the first half of session, the most bills of any committee. So we were very busy. I was, I was very pleased to be able to bring that background and experience that I've had in law and lobbying and other things in, into play there and help, help others navigate the, the, the terrain. Certainly a very, very busy session. Some of those topics you mentioned, uh, made it into bills, uh, medical malpractice, mm -hmm. uh, private school scholarships, uh, regulations on books. Those were ideas that have stalled regularly in years past in the state house, but they were able to get across the finish line this year. Uh, and it was House Republicans, namely, in years past that had kind of not been able to agree on those ideas. House leadership has said they feel redistricting was crucial in the change this year. How large of a role do you feel like you and other new members played in getting those controversial bills actually across the finish line this year? Well, I don't want to overstate, overestimate my work, work on it, but I did, sure. do think I helped. Um, I've been advoc an advocate for school choice issues and parental rights issues for a long time, so I think that helped. In fact, I've, I was pleased that the first policy bill I got to vote for in my legislative career was a 
parental rights and school choice uh, bill that I've been working on for several years. So, so I think it helped with that, and I think the redistricting made a big difference there. Uh, and just, there was a big sentiment in the freshman class in particular, and a lot of the non-freshmen that, that wanted to get these things done, and we just buckled down and got it done. So a lot of people have played a big role in it. I can think of Representative Gelbach, who had school board experience, uh, Representative Schuyler, Wheeler, uh, Representative Bowden. I could go on and name many others, but so many people had a role in getting that done and bringing their different backgrounds and perspectives to it. Now that you're out of session, but that bill is kind of coming to fruition with, you know, the next school year, there's been some concern about uh, private schools raising tuition. Um, when you're out of session, you know, how close of an eye are you and, and other Republicans keeping on, you know, how laws like that actually play out? Well, I expect some of them might raise their tuition. That's, that's fine. Uh, one of the things we kept hearing over and over on the education funding, which, by the way, our education funding was the second highest in 13 years, the SSA we did. And so we kept hearing how teachers are underpaid. And I don't disagree that public school teachers are probably underpaid, but uh, private school teachers are even more, more woefully underpaid. So I don't have a problem if we're helping those teachers get a little, a little more for their work as well. But some will raise their tuition, some won't, but th they can't exceed the, uh, the uh, ASA anyway. So. Now, talking about potentially next session, it feels like it's a long ways away, but now that you've uh, wrapped up the first one, what are you looking forward to next year? What are the big things you're hoping to still accomplish? So my guardianship and conservatorship, I probably spent literally 50 hours on that bill this year, trying to work with 16 different interest groups across the board getting some compromise done there. So I look forward to moving that forward. Uh, I know Chairman Holt of the Judiciary Committee and I, we, we both share an interest in some shared parenting things. We kept hearing about that, but it was just the bandwidth wasn't there to take it up this year. Uh, and, and property tax, I'm very pleased with the property tax reform that we passed this year, but everybody, us included, keeps saying that's step number one, so I'm looking forward to doing some more in property tax reform. Coming up on Close Up, new faces on the Democrats' side of the aisle as well. Coming up, first-year lawmaker Sammy Sheets' take on what was accomplished this year. And hear why Congress is also consulting former Iowa Governor Terry Branstad in the fight against climate change. Look like one scoot back. Yeah, would you mind just counting to ten one more time? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Awesome. Well, welcome back to Close Up. It has been a busy four months at the Iowa State House, and lots of lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have now officially wrapped up their first Iowa legislative session. That includes Democrat from Lynn County, Representative Sammy Sheets, who joins us now. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, like I mentioned, uh, you just wrapped up your first legislative session, and there wasn't much time for a learning curve. It was a nonstop session. The pace was very fast from the beginning. Uh, what was that experience like for you as a first-time lawmaker? It was really, really informative, but as you mentioned, it was kind of trial by fire right away. We had the voucher bill, a billion-dollar scheme to give public tax dollars away to private schools across the state of Iowa. We've debated that, I think, week two or three in the legislature. And so I think the 39 freshmen that came in to the Iowa House this year that was our kind of our first big piece of legislation that we even voted on, spoke on, in my case, in the Democratic Party's case. 
And so throughout the session, it was really just a week by week kind of fire of um, really harmful legislation for working people in this state. I mean, we heard Republicans for years talk about how they were going to fight inflation and they were talking about, you know, immigration and border policies. And they didn't do one thing regarding to inflation this session. They, hyper, they were hyper focused on bills that target marginalized kids, bills that attack working people in case of the SNAP bill. It's going to kick thousands of Iowans off of their SNAP benefits at a time when we are seeing 40 year high inflation in the state of Iowa. And it's going to kick 600 kids off of their health care, which is just really, really harmful to the people of Iowa. So while it was, you know, an incredibly intense and some would argue the, you know, the most uh, harmful session for working and marginalized people in the state, in our state's history, as a legislator to kind of have a, a firsthand view, it, it was just really detrimental and sad to see what the legislature did to the legislature did to working people this session. And you mentioned informative. Uh, tell me a little bit about kind of your expectations going into legislative session. I mean, we saw um, it was a tough cycle for for Democrats and coming into the state house, Democrats came in in the minority. Um, what was your expectation? that session was going to look like and did it live up to kind of what you were you were hoping for at least in your own personal impact? Yeah, so most of us had uh, realistic expectations. We're in the minority. We're not going to get a lot of the things that we'd like to see passed for the people of Iowa. We still did a fantastic job as a caucus of proposing legislation that would protect reproductive care in the state that would lower costs for Iowans because I mentioned we're at a period when we're facing 40 year high prices in the state of Iowa, so to help working people, um, to help um, with reproductive care, as I mentioned. A lot of those proposals that we would like to see, we just cannot get those done given the current reality. So what our job is, is to continue to advocate for marginalized people back home in our districts and for people across the state. And that means working in a bipartisan fashion to talk to legislators across the aisle to, in some cases, make really bad legislation a little bit better and the child labor bill is a perfect example of that where Democrats in the House were able to negotiate and take away some of the most catastrophic and harmful pieces of that bill um, and so while it was still a terrible bill overall that was a really good example of how we were able to work in a bipartisan fashion to improve legislation and that's really um, the best thing that we can do in the minority but what this session reminded me of, Amanda, is just how important it is for my party to take back power in this state. Working people are suffering every single day that Republicans are leading in this state. They've destroyed our public education system. Like I mentioned earlier, we're going to be giving a billion dollars of our tax dollars away to private schools. And we've seen that private schools are already raising rates and just transferring the public money um, to these wealthy individuals and wealthy private schools across the state of Iowa. So. While being in the minority is, uh, it is a reality adjustment, and especially this session when we saw so much terrible legislation, it was very uh, eye-opening for all of us, especially the freshmen, to see how the legislative process works. There are certain cases of real bipartisanship that improved legislation and made um, some bad legislation marginally less bad. Looking to the future um, coming out of this session, what are you hopeful about next session um, on what you would like to see accomplished next legislative session? There are a host of things that I would love to see accomplished next session. Unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that I would love to see and I think that working Iowans really need right now just isn't going to pass again because of um, the political realities we've been talking about. But one piece of legislation that, that I worked on and that I sponsored um, with 20 Republicans this past session was a school lunch bill that would have taken um, taxpayer dollars to give 23,000 kids in the state of Iowa access to free school lunch. Again, at a time when we're facing 40-year highs, when school pantry or when food pantries across the state of Iowa are at their limits, for a million dollars a year, we were able to provide free school lunch for 23,000 Iowa kids. And I was really proud to have 20 Republican co-sponsors. And that was really when we talk about that learning process. It was eye-opening for me to be able to go to colleagues across the aisle and say, here's an idea that I have. Is this something you'd be open to? And thankfully, 20 Republicans said that that was something that they would support, and they put their name on it. And if it would have had a vote, it would have had 56 people supporting it, and it would have passed the Iowa House. So 
uh, the school lunch bill is something that I would love to see. Hopefully a Republican can take it up next session and champion it so that it actually gets uh, a real vote and real consideration from the body. Um, but there are hosts of things that we need to see, that Iowans need to see every day, that they're unfortunately not going to get with Republicans in power at the State House. Well, we will be watching to see what happens next session and what happens over the summer to prepare for next legislative session as well. Representative Sheets, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And still to come on Close Up, why former Iowa Governor Terry Branstad told Congress switching to all electric vehicles will cause problems. And the new law now in effect that Governor Kim Reynolds says will bring more health care workers to rural Iowa. Welcome back to Close Up. Wednesday, the U.S. Senate Budget Committee held a hearing on climate change, and one of the speakers invited to the hearing by ranking member Chuck Grassley was former Iowa governor and ambassador to China Terry Branstad, who told the committee that renewable fuels, not electric vehicles, should be America's focus when it comes to green transportation. Governor, uh, the EPA has announced its plan to mandate two-thirds of all new vehicles by electric by 2032. Uh, polls show that most Americans don't want to move in this direction, uh, particularly because of the expense of the electric vehicle. Also, the Chinese Communist Party has a monopoly on critical mineral mining and refining uh, required by most EV uh, batteries and is forcing the Uyghurs into slavery to bolster their supply chain. What should we be doing as lawmakers to better compete with China and to promote domestic energy security? In the world, we, the last thing in the world we ought to do is become dependent on China for the rare earth minerals and the batteries. We have renewable energy produced in the heartland of America and with the sequestration of CO2, it becomes less polluting than electric vehicles. So we ought to be investing in that. That's what we're doing in Iowa. I think a lot of, in fact, we're partnering with several other states in the Midwest to do that sequestration. 
We have three different projects involved in that. They will be completed by the year 2025, and that will give us an advantage. We don't need to be stupid like California, and they don't even have the ability to generate the electricity if you go to all all electric vehicles. And frankly, uh, there's a lot of problems with that, the disposal of the batteries, we could go on and on. But the biggest problem is being dependent on China, who is our biggest competitor in the world, and they are committed to being the world leader and displacing the United States. And now a world leader in putting CO into the air. Members of the Congress consistently peddle the alarmist idea that climate change will cause economic shock to the world's market, making arguments that regressive tax hikes and costly federal regulation are the only answer to uh, fight climate change. Uh, is that your experience? Exactly the opposite. What we have found is investing in renewables and encouraging uh, farmers to have the opportunity to do innovative things such as no-till and cover crops and things like that have made a real difference. And now, of course, we're working on sequestration of carbon so that we'll be more competitive and uh, emitting less than electric vehicles and not have all the problems of being dependent on China for the rare earth minerals and for the batteries and then the disposal of the batteries. They haven't thought this whole thing through. We have a solution and we're well along in implementing it and many other states in the Midwest are working with us on it. Now other speakers like former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull say some of those concerns about electric cars could be eliminated if the West ramped up its own production of batteries and solar panels. We should be criticizing ourselves for not doing more to be competitive. So I totally welcome what you're doing. In terms of rare earths and minerals, we've got a lot of them in Australia. We've got to bring these, these supply chains back with our friends. That is absolutely critical. And still to come on Close Up, the new law that supporters say will get more healthcare workers to rural Iowa. Welcome back to Close Up. Wednesday, Governor Kim Reynolds traveled to Washington County to sign a bill into law that she says will help ease the shortage of health care workers in rural Iowa. The law drops the requirement that physician assistants must work under the supervision of a doctor. Instead, health clinics and state licensing boards would be responsible for physician assistant oversight. 
Governor Reynolds was asked how this will help rural hospitals and clinics deal with the shortage of health care workers. So what it does is it eliminates the supervisory agreements that are currently in place. And what we found out is that's a national trend that's happening across the country. And then you couple that with the fact that only 40% of our PAs were staying in the state of Iowa. The majority were going to other states where they had more freedom and flexibility uh, to be able to provide services. And healthcare is just, you know, in a very tenable position right now, especially after COVID. And we need to figure out ways that we can provide quality health care to Iowans, uh, especially in rural Iowa, where access tends to be more of an issue. Uh, originally, there was some concern about them not having some supervisory capacity, and so there was an agreement that was made that before they can go on their own or without the agreement, they had to have two years under their belt with some supervisory um, uh, component to it. And that, uh, with that in place, uh, there was uh, they, no opposition, and we were able to get it through both chambers and to uh, be able to sign in today. And as you can tell by those that spoke, this is a game changer for rural hospitals, and it really makes a difference uh, to be able to provide that access to, to Iowa to meet it. We want to make sure that we can do everything we can to maintain health care in Iowa. Thank you. So that was a, a big focus of your condition of the state address. Can you talk about how this bill fits into maybe other pieces of legislation seeking to address this issue of expanding access to medical care in rural Yeah, life. well, we're trying to do loan forgiveness. We're looking at ways that we can do fellowships so that we can drive maternal health. We have centers of excellence that we've stood up. We're going to look for ways to continue to, to build that out in rural Iowa. Uh, the tour reform that we passed, the MedMal tour reform, was huge. Uh, that really provided, um, that was driving uh, physicians and just healthcare professionals out of the state as well. We were an outlier, and so that will help us retain and attract. I've had physicians come up to me at different areas and just say thank you for doing that. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Especially for OBGYNs, we are dead last in on a per capita basis on OBGYNs in the state of Iowa. And so that's another access issue and we want to be sure that we're you know, um, re attracting and retaining our quality uh, health care professionals. So that, there were some other things that we do that uh, that we did this legislative session that allows us to draw down more federal dollars, which again will help uh, a lot of our hospitals are experiencing some losses, and so that will help kind of um, bridge that gap until they can start to get things kind of kind of back on track. And again, trying to work ourselves out of COVID. It's just it just takes a while. And that's all the time we have. Thank you for joining us for KCCI 8 News Close Up. We'll see you back here next Sunday. Have a great day.